Are there other planets, just like our own, in terms of water, temperature, and atmosphere? Are we alone in this universe? These are questions that have interested humanity ever since it started. And in order to answer these questions, we first need to find these other planets. This is what my summer research at NASA Ames focused on, to find these other planets. And what does data science have to do with all of that? We will shortly see, don't worry. So I'm going to give you a talk about how data science discovers new planets. I'm going to introduce myself first. My name is Noe Cheska uh, And I came to, how did I end up at NASA? So my background was in aerospace. And I was actually a satellite operator and later on a satellite engineer. And I did my bachelor's degrees in electrical engineering. When I went to electrical engineering, I didn't know that I was going to go there and what the, I will find myself loving is data science. I thought I was more attracted to physics and less to computer science. But then I did my final bachelor's project in natural language processing also known as NLP. And this field really drew my attention, and I decided to do my master's in natural language processing. Then Israel announced there is an opening for an intern at NASA AIDS Research Center. And one of the projects up in the list was a project that combines both astrophysics and artificial intelligence. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, I have to get this. This is my dream job. It's going to combine both my love for space and for artificial intelligence. And fortunately, I was elected to be the first Israeli to go to NASA Ames. And, and I was very proud to present my country. You can see uh, our flag is right there in the middle of NASA Ames, and I was really proud to hold it. And I'm going to talk to you in this lecture about my experience over there. So, who recognized this lady in the image? <laughs> who is she? <laughs> Gal Gadot, yeah, she's a Wonder Woman. And I'm not showing you her only because she's Israeli, if you didn't know, but mostly because I think women in STEM, especially in data science, are kind of Wonder Women. And it shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't be Wonder Woman in order to be in data science. Data science needs us all. And as Dr. Faye Faye Lee said, who is a professor at Stanford, AI shouldn't benefit us all, but it also should reflect us all. So if you heard, um, AI can tend to be biased to certain um, gender, race, etc. And if not, if the group won't be diverse enough, AI can neglect the knowledge it needs in order to represent the entire community. For example, you might have heard that Amazon just launched a system to recognize if a CV of a candidate is likely to be accepted to the company or not. The system decided, based on the statistics, that if a woman, if the CV is of a woman, it's likely to be unaccepted to the company since there are a lot, not a lot of women there. This is what we call the imbalanced data set problem. And since on the team, I guess there weren't enough women to know this is problem, they had to discard their entire project and declare it was unsuccessful. So this is just one example of how diverse we need our groups in data science to be. And for you, women, be yourself. Don't be afraid to be who you are and believe in yourself. And for the male I see right here, be an equal partner at home and support the women who work with you as colleagues or study with you as student colleagues. So this is a short thing about what it's like being a woman. At NASA, I was one out of eight interns, um, and I was the only female intern. And in my group, the data science group, there were four researchers, full-time researchers, and only one out of four was a female. And the team lead was a man. 
So we still have a long way to go, and we're getting there step by step, but we still have work to do. And this is also my first time in Russia, so thank you for inviting me. I love St. Petersburg, I had a great time here, and you can see me here uh, in front of the church of the Cedar on, uh, the, on, on the bleak. On the bottom. Sorry? Cedar <laughs> on the bluff. Yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot the name of this beautiful, colorful church. <laughs> um, and I'm really glad to be here, especially after the International Space Week, because you guys had the first men flying into space. So uh, I'm really excited to be here in Russia and share with you my space-related experience. Um, so let's go back to the group I was at NASA. As I told you guys, I was a part of the data science group. It's a group that does what I thought was science fiction. We actually work on. So this group is super diverse. It does many different things from biology to aerospace to astrophysics and even to um, uh, what I, uh, you will see soon in my project. Uh, I will talk to you about three different projects that my colleagues did, and, and then we'll dive into my project. So, one of my friends had a very cool project that does a lot with computer vision and image processing. So, they use satellite imagery from the Amazonas forest. The Amazonas forest is the largest rainforest in the world. In order to identify what causes the greenness of the Amazonas forest? So what causes the pixels in the image to be greener, which means there is more um, vegetation? So they took into account a lot of different factors, such as temperature, uh, precipitation, and so on. And they found out what causes the amount of green in the Amazonas. And guess what? It wasn't precipitation like most of you think. It was actually the temperature in the dry season. So this is one of the few cool things that the data science group did at NASA AIDS. Now, another very cool project is a project my friend did. Um, and it's binarizing images of eye vessels. So what does this have to do with NASA? Um, so when astronauts fly into space, their eyes is exposed to radiation and lack of gravity. And this stuff can eventually lead to blindness. In order to avoid this horrible thing, their eye is being monitored and taken pictures of. And this eye, uh, this binarized eye, what I mean by binarized is it's, it's only black and white. The background will be black and the vessels will be white. This binarized image is going into a system that can recognize if this eye is being damaged or not. In order to create this image from that image, it takes a whole day of a biology to sit and indicate which parts are the vessels and which parts are the background. We use deep learning methods in order to transform this image to that image and to save a lot of time of biologists. So this is the second project my colleague was working on. And the third project <laughs> is related to aerospace. So this friend, he worked on something that uh, helped us to recognize when there will be needed a manual intervention in order to fly an aircraft. He took into account a lot of different uh, criteria and wanted to see when does the pilot have to interfere? So uh, these are our three projects, and as you can see, they're super diverse and only in one single group at NASA. And of course, my project was the coolest. Uh, I searched for exoplanets. So I searched for exoplanets. What are these exoplanets? So exoplanets are planets outside our solar system. Uh, just like our own, we have a lot of different other stars that have planets orbiting them. So let's first make it clear. A star is something that emits light, just like our sun. A planet is an object orbiting a star, just like our planet Earth. Okay? 
So, so far, according to today, I just checked it before the lecture, <laughs> there have been 3,791 confirmed exoplanets. Uh, so, as you can see, it's a lot of exoplanets out there. And they are in 2,828 different solar systems. So, you can see, just like in our own solar system, there are other solar systems out there that have multiple planets orbiting them. And the first exoplanet was discovered in 92. Uh, I bet most of you guys weren't born even yet. I was born, I was two years old. Uh, but as you can see, it's a relatively new field. So there was a lot of input put into this field. Okay, so how do we find these exoplanets? We use satellites. So this is the satellite I worked on its data set. It's called TESS, Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And it was launched only this April. So when I was at NASA, I didn't actually have the chance to work on TESS data set because I was there until August. But I worked on the simulated data set and we'll get to that later. So, as you can see, TESS is relatively small. You can see here a human being, and that's about the size of the satellite. It's about the size of a fridge. And TESS has four CCDs, these four things, which are like, just like the cameras in our cell phone, and they measure the amount of light each and every second. And the weight of TESS is around 400 kilograms, so it's not that heavy in terms of satellites, which is cost efficient. Um, and also, TESS was launched in a very high elliptical orbit, which means it's very close to Earth at some point and very far from Earth at another point. And it rotates around, uh, its orbit takes 13.5 days around the Earth. So, TESS wasn't the first mission to look for exoplanets. The first mission was named Kepler. So, Kepler, who was launched in 2009, was the former mission. And it had a very different purpose. Before Kepler, we didn't even know if there are any exoplanets out there, not to mention the thousands we saw earlier. So Kepler was a statistical mission. We tried to understand, are there exoplanets out there? If there are, how many? How many are Earth-like? How many are not Earth-like? How many planets are inside one solar system? So Kepler was a more statistical mission. TESS, on the other hand, is a more um, precise mission. We're looking eventually to find 50 planet candidates, which are our exoplanets, who resemble Earth, who look like Earth, um, in terms of temperature, atmosphere, and so on. So, I want you now, when we are comparing to Kepler, to think as data scientists. Think what are the challenges and what are the differences between the two tasks. Okay, so, first, first difference. This is a picture from Hubble Telescope, okay? So Hubble Telescope field of view is about a gray of the sand if I stretch my arm in front of my eyes. So this amount of stars is what you see in a field view of a gray of the sand. Kepler, on the other hand, was of the field of view of the palm of my hand if I stretch it in front of my face. And Tess is the entire sky. So, first difference is that the scientists were gonna have a lot of data. <laughs> um, and that means we need more automatic methods to classify it. Another main difference is the frequency we will receive the new data. So, Kepler was looking, we said, at this palm of hand for years. Years and years it was looking at the same exact place in the sky. Tess, on the other hand, is 
going to look at every different sector each and every 27 days. So here in this short film you can see um, each of the um, stripes is a sector of 27 days and it's a four square since we have four CCDs. It's going to cover the southern hemisphere first and then the northern hemisphere. It's going to be a mission of two years. Um, and as you can see, most of the skies will be covered only for 27 days, except for the southern and northern pole, which will be covered for an entire year. But, in any case, we'll have a new data set each and every 27 days, which means 27 days only to process it, to understand if there are exoplanets there, and to draw a conclusion for the next 27 days. The third difference is how far this, um, this telescope is going to look at. So Kepler was looking at stars 3,000 light years away from us. One light year is 10 to the 16 meters. So it's 10 trillion meters, kilometers, sorry. So it's really, really far away. So at test, we're looking at closer area, only 200 light years away, which is still very far away. But the reason we do that is because, as we said, TESS eventually wants to find 50 planet candidates. So we want to have the ability to follow up observation, to send other satellites or from Earth to explore more in order to understand the planets better. And in order to do those follow-up observations, we need to be closer to the stars. Okay, so now uh, let's talk data scientific language. If I compare this to mission, um, I can look at precision and recall, which are very common metrics in data science. I don't know if all of you know it, so let's go over it. Um, so, precision is a metric that measures how many selected items are relevant, how many of the stars that we say are exoplanets are actually exoplanets. And recall is a different metric, it's how many relevant items are selected, how many of the exoplanets we said are exoplanets are, are um, actually among the total amount of exoplanets that are out there, okay? So if I try to um, hardly categorize Kepler to one metric and test to another metric, which one do you think is belonging to precision and which one is to recall? Which one is more important that we find a planet candidate that we're certain is a planet candidate, and which one is more important that we know the total amount of exoplanets out there? What do you guys think? Who thinks precision should belong to tests? Raise your hand. <laughs> Who thinks precision should belong to Kepler? Raise your hand. Okay, I will help you guys. So precision belongs more to TESS and we come more to Kepler. Because at TESS, we want to be certain that the planet candidates we said are actual planet candidates are really planet candidates. And at Kepler, we were at a statistical mission and we cared less about uh, the precision, but we wanted to cover the entire amount of stars. So this is a brief overview. Mostly we use these two metrics in an harmonic average which is called F1 score. Okay, so when you think about exoplanets, I guess what you're imagining is this. This is an artist concept who has very high imagination because what we actually see is this. So it's a lot We'll get back to it in a second. So how does identification of planet candidate look like? 
It's called transit photometry. This is the most common method nowadays to identify exoplanets. So let's see how it works. It's very, very simple. So when an object, just like this planet, transpasses upon a star, a dimming of the light occurs. So we measure the amount of light coming to us. And when nothing passes upon the star, we see a certain amount of light. But when an object transpasses upon a star, we see a dip in the amount of light. If this dip is periodic, we can sometimes conclude we're talking about a planet candidate. So let's go back to this drawing. What we actually see here is data I used from the test simulation. So if you look closely, you can see it's very, very noisy. The x-axis is the time, and the y-axis is the normalized flux. Flux is the amount of light we measure, and here it's normalized. Um, each sample is taking every two minutes, and we said every sector is of 27 days. So we have around 20k samples here. So you can see it's very, very noisy, but if you look closely, you can see a drop of light here, 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 and here. And this is actually uh, a signature of the planet candidate. So um, I want you to remember three terms, which we will use later. And these three terms are what we call, we define an ephemeris. Ephemeris is a way to describe a celestial object. Um, so those three terms are epoch, period, and duration. Epoch is the time that went by since we saw the first drop of light. Period is the amount of time between two drops of light. It's the thing in blue. And duration, the thing in green, is how much time we were in a bit darkness. How much time does the drop happen? And this is what defines the signature of the ephemeris. Okay, ephemeris, as we said, describe a celestial object, an object in the sky. Um, so it looks easy, right? Just look for these drops, and that's it. Why do we need data science? Why do we need artificial intelligence to solve this? Wait, let's go before that. Why do we need astrophysics? Just like Rajesh from the Big Bang, if you know him. <laughs> uh, why do we need these astrophysics to go over our data set and classify it to planet candidates or not? It looks quite simple, right? Um, the reason is that it's not that easy. There are other astrophysical phenomena and instrumental phenomena which damage our ability to understand it. Let's go over them quickly. So the first problem that's going to occur is what we call eclipse in binary. So I was surprised to learn that, and you might be surprised as well, that most of the stars in the sky, not most, but around 50%, are stars that are orbiting one another. So imagine our sun having another sun orbiting uh, one another. And this phenomenon is very frequent and it can have a very similar signature to the one we just saw. The same problem might occur in the background of another star, so having two stars rotating in the background of our main star. Another problem is what we call sunspots. So the sun has areas on it which are a little bit darker, and not that a lot of people know that, but a star is also rotating around itself. So this amount of light can also cause a similar signature. And of course, the satellite. The satellite is not just orbiting smoothly and quietly around Earth. It looks more like <laughs> very noisy, very high radiation, changing temperature, a lot of different facts that can cause our signature to be noisy and incorrect. Um, but to prove you again that it's not a simple mission, I prepared a quiz. So I need your collaboration, don't worry. 
I'm going to show you a signature, just like the one we saw. And in each and every signature, I want you guys to tell me if what we see is an exoplanet, a planet, what we call a planet candidate, or not, or something else. Okay, so let's start. Um, okay, so here we can see two drops of light, and we see uh, it's not very noisy. What do you guys think? Did we find the next exoplanet? Are we going to publish a paper together and be very happy about it? Who thinks it's an exoplanet? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's some other thing? Raise your hand. Is a lot fewer 
than the other phenomena. So I could build the perfect classifier that will just say, not exoplanet for everything I show him, and it will be 97% of the time correct. So this imbalanced data set problem is a problem that will occur to you in a lot of the projects you guys are working on. And there are many solutions to this problem, and we're going to discuss a few of them. But please notice that the metric also has to be updated accordingly, because if I just use accuracy, and I say, it's not a planet candidate, that's what my algorithm does, I get already 97% of uh, accuracy, but I did nothing. Um, another problem is that I worked with simulated data set. As I told you guys, I didn't have access to the um, uh, operational data set because the satellite didn't go operational yet. So I had to work with simulated data set, which resembles the truth but has some differences that needs to be addressed. Uh, another problem which is very, very common in data science is that the data set is easily overfitted. Overfitting is a problem when you build a model that is too precise on the examples you showed it and does not know how to generalize well. So this is also a very common, in very common problem in data science. Um, and in order to solve it, there are many different techniques and we're going to discuss a few of them. And uh, the last problem that we talked about was choosing the right metric to analyze best our results. Okay, so I understand some of you have some machine learning background, some of you don't. So we're going to do a very short deep learning um, uh, just to show you guys a little bit an introduction of what deep learning is. This does not replace any deep learning class you guys are going to take, just so we will talk on the same page for the rest of the lecture. Um, so for some of you it will be familiar, and you'll be proud of yourself for knowing that, and for some of you it will be something new that you learn. Um, so first of all, let's organize the mess that sometimes we have about AI, machine learning, and deep learning. So AI, or artificial intelligence, is the general name for the field uh, that we give computer the ability to have intelligence, the ability to make decisions, the ability to make predictions, the ability to make classifications, anything that we um, give intelligence to the computer to do. Um, artificial intelligence inside of it holds a part that's called machine learning. So machine learning is a set of algorithms to solve some of the artificial intelligence problems. And it contains uh, some algorithms you might have known, such as KNN, SVM, uh, decision trees, and so on. And inside machine learning, there is a very growing field that's called deep learning. And the reason it's going late, growing only lately is due to two reasons, in my belief. One is the computational resources. They become more available and have the high ability to process a lot of multiplications in a very short time. And the second reason is that brilliant researchers worked on some of the heavy deep learning problems that, which did not allow us to proceed, um, such as vanishing gradients, if some of you have heard of, but problems that could not enable us to work with deep learning methods. So this is just to put everything into perspective. Now let's talk generally how um, in machine learning we build a model. We divide it into two phases. One is called model training, and the one is called model testing. So how does model training generally work like? This is a general scheme, and you will, um, it's a general solution for most of the problem in machine learning. So we have the features, what we call examples, fed into our model. For each and every example, we make a prediction of 
uh, some output. So if it's a classification problem, like our own, we make a prediction if it's a planet candidate or not. Then we compare the predicted labels to the true labels, and according to what we call a loss function, we update our model. This is what we call supervised learning. Supervised because we have this true label thing. So we do this for each and every example that's coming, and we update our model each and every time, and sometimes we do it over and over again for the same examples. This is the training part. Now, the testing part. So for the testing part, it looks very similar. We put into uh, the, net, the model our features, which are our examples, and the model makes a prediction. But now we don't have this feedback anymore. We don't have this loss function anymore. We just predict the labels. And if we're testing the models, and we have two labels, we can compare these two labels and draw conclusions on how well our model behaved. Um, this is a very general uh, view of solutions of machine learning. Now let's go back to feature learning versus feature engineering. So let's say we have this problem and we want to classify if an image has a car or is not a car. Um, so when we do feature engineering, we have some domain expert who understands cars very well. He knows that the car has four wheels. He knows that the car is this height and this width. He knows that the car drives at this velocity and so on. So this domain expert, or um, sometimes it's a data scientist, sometimes uh, in, in, our, in my case it was an astrophysicist, depends on the division of the work, but he can say these are the features that will help me classify if it's a car or not. And he feeds it into his model and then makes the prediction. Feature learning as opposed to feature engineering, we give an input the image of the car and we expect the model to learn by itself which are the correct features to classify upon a car. So some may tell you the feature learning part is more similar to deep learning, and the feature engineering part is more similar to machine learning. I'm telling you it's something in the middle. We still need to have some domain expertise, even if we're working with deep learning methods where the features are extracted automatically. Okay? Um, and last thing we talk about, everything except for deep learning. So what is deep learning? Very, very short. So deep learning is coming from the name of deep neural networks. Deep because it's a hierarchy of a lot of neural networks. So a neural network works a little bit just like our brain. It's inspired by the brain, don't be mistaken, it's not imitating the brain. Um, and just like our neurons can um, be activated or disactivated, we can learn if a feature should be activated or disactivated. So this is deep learning. So um, at NASA, I had time to also tour inside the building. I got to see very, very cool different things. So here on the left, <laughs> you can see me really excited next to what they call the Super Bowl, which is a robot sent to explore other planets. Uh, and the cool thing about it is that it's super symmetrical and it walks in a very funny way. It just changes its shape and falls to the front or to the back. So it's very, very clumsy. And what they do is they use AI techniques in order to make the walking smoother. But this structure enables the robot to go under very uh, narrow creeks or low creeks. And, and it's really cool to watch. Here, it's also very exciting. You can see me next to a quantum computer. Um, so for those of you who have heard about quantum computers, it's going to change everything we know about computer science. Because uh, if you've heard about NP problems, which are problems which we cannot solve in polynomial time, so these quantum computers could solve NP problems in a matter of seconds.
which means we will change everything we know about cryptology and programming and absolutely everything will become probabilistic and it's very exciting to see it for the first time. I told my husband I'm going to show it one day to our grandchildren and tell them this is the first time grandma saw a quantum computer. But we'll see. <laughs> um, and here you can see me at the wind tunnel. They tested the World Cup soccer ball uh, in order to see that it actually has the right uh, flowing uh, dimensions and uh, criteria. And here you can see me uh, flying this, the vertical simulator at NASA, which was also very, very exciting. And here I want to show you my friends, not only because they are my friends and I love them, but I wanted to show you uh, what diverse backgrounds people come to do uh, space research. So these two are mechanical engineering. She is a chemical engineer. This is me. Uh, I'm a computer scientist focusing on artificial intelligence. Uh, she's an aerospace engineer and he's a biomedical engineer. He actually worked on the iVessel project I talked to you earlier. Um, and here's me having fun. <laughs> and of course I get to see astronauts. So this is Reed Wiseman. He was super nice and he was in space for six months. And I got to meet him in Houston uh, in Texas. And this is the mission control room which is very nice. And I got to speak to an astronaut who was actually in space, Ricky Arnold. This was also very excited. I got elected to represent NASA Ames as one of the interns and to ask him a question live at the ISS. And his microphone was actually floating in the air while he was answering my question. It was very, very cool. Um, so just to sum up, my project was just one example of how broad data science is and in how many directions it can go. Data science projects can be in fashion, in economics, in sociology, in space, in natural language processing. These are tools which really give you the ability to explore everything you love and go do something you love. And uh, lastly, I wanted to 